Welcome to another Anarchism Research Group video. In this presentation, given as part of the Anarchist Studies Network online conference panels, Peterson Silver talks about the role the concept of legitimacy plays in anarchist political theory. Don't forget to click subscribe and like and share this video. Hi, uh, my name is Peterson Silver and I am a PhD student from UFSC Brazil with research funded by Brazilian agencies CAPES, NC and PQ. Uh, thank you all very much for watching. Uh, I want to thank in particular Thomas Swan for the hard work of organizing the event and I feel very proud to be presenting an excellent company today. Uh, I'm going to talk about legitimacy, which was the theme of my master's dissertation, and uh, I'm going to discuss whether the concept is helpful for anarchists at all. We ought to begin by understanding what exactly legitimacy is. Most sociologists and political scientists are at least aware of Max Weber's thesis. When people believed a certain authority to be legitimate, that ensured that orders would be obeyed and therefore legitimacy would be a foundation for relations of domination. For David Beetham, however, that amounted to saying, well, people believe the power is legitimate and then it is, or they don't and then it isn't. Beetham's point was that this doesn't help explain why people sometimes don't think power is legitimate and doesn't help assess rationally whether they should think it is. He explains that a certain relation of power is not legitimate because people believe it is, but because it can be justified in terms of their beliefs. So despite this relevant disagreement, there is convergence in understanding the effect of legitimacy, that being the stability of the social relations that are its object. With that in mind, I'd like to explore legitimacy as a relation between a subject, an object and a set of beliefs and values. This relation being something that underpins or attempts to establish an absence of conflict. So you can have different models of legitimacy in the sense that each different idea of what legitimacy is implies a different set of these three elements. So with this definition, I am not trying to exorcise conflict from politics, nor saying that legitimacy only exists where there is no conflict. In fact, uh, there would be no point to the idea of legitimacy if there weren't any conflicts in the first place. Legitimacy and conflict are not opposites, they complement each other. So, it is true that human life is full of conflict, uh, but it is also true that, as a consequence, we are always striving to resolve them. Uh, so, to do that, conflicting parties have to agree on a process to sort through it, because if they don't, they have a conflict about how to solve the conflict, and that second conflict will have to be sought through somehow. So you can see the relation between conflict and legitimacy is recursive, right? So every conflict immediately enacts a more abstract level of interaction, and on that level, an absence of conflict allows for the lower level conflicts to be resolved. So we can talk about legitimacy descriptively when that higher level procedure has full acceptance or we can talk about it as a normative idea when people are talking about what they think should be our process of interaction, right? And so to argue about legitimacy is to try to generate this absence of conflict about something. Traditionally, Western legitimacy has been all about reflecting on the use of force in conflict resolution. So there are two aspects of that impulse in Western political theory. The first is related to a certain notion of human nature, the idea that we are monsters in disguise that need to be tamed or will all destroy each other. So Marshall Salins has argued that monarchy and republicanism are two traditional ways of dealing with that, right, within the Western tradition. So either the imposition of order by an external force or self-regulated order through the opposition of equal powers. But both imply the use of force to enforce procedures for a conflict resolution. But since violence is itself conflict, this isn't a stable arrangement unless people can agree that violence is acceptable. So notice we're on a third level now, right? So we have the lower level conflicts, procedures to solve the lower level conflicts, and violence to guarantee that these procedures will be respected. So all the efforts to get people to accept the moral frameworks to justify violence uh, come from that uh, framework, right? So the second aspect is an ideology of us versus them. Uh, 
So in the ancient Greek polis, right, you don't threaten other citizens, you discuss matters in the public arena. But those who do not share our civilized ethers, right, they can't be trusted. So the use of force is understood to be necessary much more frequently. The contemporary incarnation of that logic is, of course, most easily found in racism and colonialism. So we can see the influence of these two aspects in two models of legitimacy that I argue represent most mainstream contemporary political theory. With model one, uh, a collective, for instance the citizens, legitimize its governing body in defense of a certain set of values. And these can vary. They could be material prosperity, religious piety, cultural unity, and so on and so forth. The diversity of interests in a group produces conflict about what the will of the people is, and a procedure such as an election is devised to rank these interests, to give them specific form, and authorize the use of force because you have to ensure that the will of the people is carried out against opposition, external or internal, of minorities, for instance. Uh, now, of course, many questions follow from that model, right? Uh, do elections really constitute valid consent of the people, even considering its internal inequalities and power relations? Shouldn't a project demand absolute consensus to be considered the will of an entire group of people? Isn't the use of violence in defense of procedures one of the causes of many problems that people have with them to the point that they lose legitimacy, therefore making it harder to actually solve conflicts? So, of course, I won't belabor on these points, because since this is a panel of anarchist theory, I assume most people here are at least aware of these discussions. Now, the second model of legitimacy, let's call it Model 2, is not so internally varied. Its set of values are quite fixed, actually. Stability, order, predictability. So, peace is so desirable that the enforcement of the procedures that mediate conflict trumps any other consideration. In this model, the subject is not a collective entity, but a presumed abstract individual. In this camp, you can find legal positivists and so-called realist political theorists that argue that cooperation would not be possible if self-interest isn't kept in check by organized coercion. So they depart from this hypothetical egoist subject to say that the object of legitimacy, the use of force to protect certain forms of conflict resolution, is a universal logical conclusion. Although both models 1 and 2 support the existence of the state apparatus, they are not the same. In model 2 there is no democratic requirement, whereas in model 1 it is there, but in a Schmittian sense. What most displeases theorists of the model 2 kind is that leaving legitimacy to the subjectivity of a group of people seems like an unsafe foundation for justifying the use of force, and hence they would rather argue their way into a prescription for it that does not depend on people's desires. So you can see the link between Model 2 and colonialism. Stability is the chief value for colonizers because they want to keep things how they are. So any other value, especially the colonized ones, is dangerous. Just as the subjectivity of the colonized must be denied, the subject of legitimacy in this model is not actual people, but hypothetical humans. So, um, but the thing is, at home, internally, the logic of Model 1 might be applied instead. So, of course it's unacceptable the police is doing to us what our military is doing internationally. So, of course people have the right to determine the direction of society, what the use of force ought to protect. Now, this is all very broad, and I'm very simplistic, I'm aware. Model 2, for example, is also used at home to argue for the need for institutions that guard fundamental rights of individuals and minorities against majority overreach. In and out very often intersect, depending on the several networks people take part in. But despite the differences, both models are based on a shared assumption, the need for a constant Leviathan sword over our heads. So it is no surprise, then, that legitimacy is looked upon with suspicion in anarchist thought. Legitimacy is invoked to silence dissent by justifying state violence and to co-opt social struggles by channeling them into institutions that sabotage any prospect of meaningful change. But again, if we step back and see legitimacy as a key concept for human sociability in general, basically uh, it's about coping with conflict, we are able to devise anarchist models of legitimacy. Let's back let's go back sorry let's go back to the basic structure of models of legitimacy subject object and values 
As to the object, the use of force is not legitimized. In fact, quite the opposite. The object of legitimacy is that conflicts should be resolved non-violently. I shall return to this point later. As to the subject, anarchists um, do not share the pessimistic view of human nature, although their view is not optimistic either. It is a social view of human nature. The subject of legitimacy is the individual, but not the hypothetical egoist one, the social one, which also excludes any notion of hyper-individualism that tends to connect so well with capitalism. So, it means that individuals should be given the moral respect, the education, the material safety, and the institutional frameworks to be able to say, hey, something's wrong here, I don't agree with how things are going, uh, we should work something better out. Which is a conflict, of course, and that is the point. Conflicts like this will happen, and that is okay, but the idea that anarchists hope will hold together different views of how things should be organized, so different communities, identities, practices, is the absence of conflict and agreement on the idea that all sorts of conflicts should be resolved without resorting to violence. As to the set of values, they are, of course, anarchist values, that meaning, at the very least, the rejection of social hierarchies. And therefore, you can see why this challenges any essentialist divisions that make it harder for people to recognize in others a capacity to solve conflicts without resorting to violence. But at the same time, there is an active rejection of violence as something that initiates a relationship of domination. And uh, anyway, among other important values, we could count diversity in contrast with the monism of Model 1 or any deceiving pluralism that can be associated with Model 2. So, even if people agree it is reasonable to institute majority voting, they have to ensure that people feel respected and satisfied, otherwise minorities might think the rules are just a ruse to keep them under a thumb, in which case there might be a conflict about the rules and therefore no legitimacy. It is the fear of such a problem being too frequent and too dangerous that gets the Model 2 people to argue for the use of force to protect the procedures at all cost. Anarchists think that the cost of instability, but mostly our communal commitments in defense of these visions of free relations, are factors that contribute to the stability of non-violent arrangements. Now, violence is a kind of conflict, and even if everyone thought like an anarchist, even if society were structured according to this idea of legitimacy, it does not mean that this would prevent conflict from emerging. That is not the point of legitimacy, really. And therefore, this cannot guarantee that this conflict that emerges will not be violent. Moreover, this model of legitimacy does not mean that anarchists will never use force, for instance, in acts of resistance or in revolutionary contexts. I'm not arguing for a pacifist anarchism, but I am saying that whatever force anarchists deem necessary will not be put to use to replace the current organized violence. Self-defense might require the use of force, but it is not this force itself that will resolve the conflict, because violence is conflict. What will resolve conflicts, and this is found throughout the anarchist tradition, pacifist or otherwise, doesn't matter, is social, economic, cultural, political changes that improve our relations with one another, improve people's lives, and destroy structures of domination, organized, centralized coercion being one of them. So, self-defense is one thing, but anarchists argue that we should investigate what gave birth to the aggression that made self-defense necessary and find a way to deal with that. Anarchism is not about the working class defeating the bourgeoisie with guns. It's the much harder project for there to not be a division between working and non-working classes anymore. Something that might involve arms through at some point, sure, but requires way more than that. When the assumption is that conflict can only be resolved with force because it comes from a beastly nature, with no intention to review in the practices that are turning us into beasts, you can be sure that it's a model of legitimacy defended by those who are unwilling to question the way society is organized. So in conclusion, as legitimacy plays an essential role in human sociability, it is useful for anarchists. Despite its current status in mainstream political theories, um, anarchists can dispute its meaning in an effort to broaden our ideas about human possibilities. Thank you very much.